London, England, a cosmopolitan city, home to over seven million people. Traffic congestion has long been a problem in the metropolis. 150 years ago, London needed a solution to its transport problems. The solution was to give the world its first underground railway system. The history of the London Underground, next on Modern Marvels. King's Cross Station, one of central London's busiest underground stations. Six different tube lines meet here, and it also serves a major railroad station, with 67 million passengers passing through each year. Few realise the role it played in giving London its underground. The first steam railways had begun in 1825, and 25 years later, King's Cross was a terminus for steam trains arriving in London. But the railroads were not permitted to expand any further into the capital. This meant that the 750,000 workers who arrived at the railroads each day then had to find a way to get to work in the heart of the city. This huge burden of traffic inevitably led to gridlock. London of the 1850s was one of the world's largest cities. It was a massively growing industrial city and a port, the hub of the start of the British Empire. Um, interestingly enough, it was a very dense and crowded city. It was still largely built on its medieval street pattern, and it meant that people basically jostled together. People lived very close to their work, and it was a very crowded city full of cobbled streets, gas lights and horse-drawn vehicles. 150 years ago, London was grinding to a halt, and it needed an ambitious solution to link the main railroad stations to the city centre. There was only one way to go, and that was underground. I think it's important to remember that for most people, the thought of actually going underground and travelling at speed underground was, was actually a very novel concept. And many Victorian writers saw death and doom and destruction to people who actually travelled on underground railways. Newspapers such as the Times actually ran quite a fierce campaign against the railway, saying that even if it worked, technically it would never pay because people would never use it. They were speculating about underground passages soaked with sewage drippings and infested by rats. Going underground was the vision of one man, Charles Pearson. He persuaded Londoners that they needed a transport network beneath the streets. He knew that if people could get in and out of the city easily, they could live further away and the slums in London would become a thing of the past. Charles Pearson was a lawyer associated with the City of London and he was the person who really first pressed for the building of the Metropolitan Railway, which was the world's first underground steam railway. And Pearson basically came up with the idea of digging a trench down the middle of the road, of roofing it over and running his railway in the bottom of the trench. The Metropolitan Railway Company broke ground in 1860. The building method used was called cut and cover and was a very expensive engineering project. It involved digging tunnels which were over 20 foot wide, laying two tracks side by side and then bricking these over to replace the road. This project took three years to complete and caused havoc to homes and businesses. The new tunnels were very shallow and ran only feet below the road surface. An example of this can still be seen in the Notting Hill district of London. There are two dummy houses, numbers 23 and 24 Leinster Gardens, which are identical to all the other houses in the street, except for one thing. Their frontage is merely a wall, five foot thick, complete with painted windows and front doors. They were built to fill the gap left in the row of houses when the line was built through the street. The Metropolitan Line opened in January 1863 and it basically connected the three major rail terminals at Paddington, at Euston and at King's Cross with the centre of the city at Farringdon. It was not conceived as a steam railway. The initial suggestion by the Metropolitan Railway's engineer John Fowler had been to have the new underground railway running on compressed air. The idea was that trains would be blown through tunnels and sucked back by air generated in great compressors at each end of the line. 
But the major flaw in this system was that the compressed air leaked continuously through the tunnel joints. With the failure of the system, the Metropolitan Railway was forced to borrow steam locomotives and rolling stock from the Great Western Railway in order to start its service. Although it's just a quaint tourist attraction today, it was a revolutionary idea and an immediate success. It carried 40,000 passengers on its first day. The timetable ran between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. with the train every 15 minutes. The time for the three and three quarter mile journey from Paddington to Farringdon was 18 minutes, stopping at all stations. Not much slower than the journey time today. This newly built railway also had one oddity when it started. When the Metropolitan Railway was first opened, it had been constructed with both seven foot gauge, which was Brunel's Great Western Railway broad gauge, because it met end on with the Great Western Railway at the Paddington end, and it had a third rail added, which also created a four foot eight and a half inch gauge track. That's Stevenson gauge. The gauge is the distance between the two running tracks. This odd twin gauge arrangement ended when the two companies, the Metropolitan Railway and the Great Western, fell out with each other. The Metropolitan went back to using Stevenson's gauge, and this is still used by most railways today. Without the locomotives from the Great Western Railway, the Metropolitan was forced into supplying their own rolling stock, and for this, they turned to the engineering company Bayer Peacock. The engine was a 440 tank engine. 440 is the wheel arrangement also used on the standard American engines of the time. And it had fairly large driving wheels as a passenger engine at the time would have, and a very, very handsome beast. Very successful, used throughout the whole 40-year period of steam on the Metropolitan Railway. The engines weighed about 46 tonnes in running order. They could carry approximately 1,000 gallons of water in their side tanks, and the coupled driving wheels were 5 feet 9 inches in diameter, driven by two 17-inch cylinders. These are the original coaches which were used in London in the 19th century. They have been carefully restored by a railway preservation society, and each year they are exhibited for enthusiasts to see. The dreadnoughts, as these carriages were known, were divided according to class. The fares charged to passengers on the Metropolitan Railway would have been according to the class they travelled in. First class would have been used by top city people travelling to their offices from their fashionable West London homes. Second class would have been used probably by the middle level of management, uh, clerks and so on. And third class anybody else who needed to travel. And they would have travelled fairly uncomfortably and in very cramped conditions on wooden boards. The success of the Metropolitan encouraged other companies to start up, and in 1874, London's second underground railway began running along the Thames embankment. This was the Metropolitan and District Railway. By 1884, a complete circular underground railroad had been constructed as a joint venture by the Metropolitan and the District Railways. They called it the Circle Line, and it's still in use today carrying passengers in its shallow tunnels just feet beneath Big Ben and the Tower of London. But the new century would bring a new technology. The use of steam locomotives on underground railways, particularly on the Metropolitan Railway and on the District Railway and, and some others, became increasingly problematical as time went on. The intensity of the service increased, the intervals between the trains shortened, and passengers were increasingly aggravated by the terrible pollution conditions which existed down there. At the same time, there were technological advances which were occurring in America, for example, and in Germany particularly, in electric traction. With electrification, the underground was able to expand. However, the extremely disruptive cut and cover method no longer seemed an option for building the railways. London couldn't cope with the chaos to its roads, and so a new type of underground construction was needed. This was going to take the builders deep into the London clay. This is a standard London underground running tunnel, manufactured out of cast iron lining rings. And this slightly larger section of tunnel that we're standing in is called a shield chamber. This is where the Great Head Shield, the device used to help build London's underground railways, was constructed and then dismantled. A South African engineer called James Henry Greathead invented a thing called a tunnelling shield, 
It was a kind of iron cylinder with a wall in which miners could actually work in safety in all the soft ground. The earth would be dug out in front of the tunnelling shield and when a hole large enough had been constructed, the device could be pushed forward. The tunnel lining could then be erected behind the shield to hold the ground up and then the process repeated. The Great Head Tunnelling Shield allowed the London Underground to expand into a deep level railway network. The shield was the single most important engineering invention used to create the Underground. London at the end of the 19th century was filled with exciting transport innovations. Permission had been granted to numerous railroad companies who were proposing deep level underground routes. But the City and South London Railway was the first to make history. In 1890, it became the first electric underground railroad in the world. The decision to actually use electric traction was a really ambitious thing to do at the time because most electric traction systems that were in use were tramways. Getting the electrical equipment small enough to actually run in a tunnel and powerful enough to move these quite large trains was a big challenge. The only way they could do it was to put all the electrical equipment into a small locomotive. The power station for the line was down at Stockwell. The problems they had were that the distribution of electricity from the power station up and down the line was not very good. So as the locomotives got further and further away from the power station and started to approach the station in the city up at King William Street, they often found that they were completely underpowered. And as the trains struggled to go up and down the hills, occasionally they would grind to a halt completely and all the lights would go out, leaving the passengers stranded in darkness. The trains had technical problems and their carriages offered little passenger comfort. They were dubbed the Sardine Box Railway, or Padded Cell, because of their claustrophobic design. But the City and South London Railway proved that electricity was the only way forward for the underground. Another electric-powered tube company began operating in 1900. The Central London Railway was opened by Queen Victoria's son, the Prince of Wales. The line was built entirely in tunnels, 10 feet in diameter, and since it ran across central London from east to west, there was never much fear that it would fail from lack of passengers. Today, the line is simply known as the Central Line and serves stations along its route, including Oxford Circus, Bond Street and Holborn. The Central London Railway was immediately popular with the travelling public. Over 14 million passengers were carried by the end of the first year. The system was popular because it adopted an American idea of a flat rate fare. It also looked across the Atlantic for its new technology. The original central London electric locomotives were, well they were called camelbacks because they had a cab in the middle and two sloping bonnets on either side, which were built in America by the General Electric Company. They were shipped to England in boxes and assembled in London. One of them was dropped off a barge into the River Thames and had to be fished out before they could build it. The passenger cars were over 45 feet long and weighed 14 tonnes. Gatemen controlled iron grilled gates at each end of the cars allowing passengers to board. The railway used direct current for its traction power. This electricity was picked up by the locomotive from a third rail positioned in the middle of the two running rails. When you want to start an electric motor driving a train, if you start it with all the power all at once, it'll either go into a skid or the motor will blow up because it's had too much power when it's standing still. So you have to apply the power gradually, rather the same way as you change up in your gears in the car. And the way they do it is they put a grid of resistors in the circuit with the motor, and the resistance reduces the amount of current getting into the motor circuit. And as you want to accelerate, you gradually step out the resistances one by one, you cut them out, and if you listen, you can hear that happening, click, 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 as the train accelerates out of the station. In 1900, London's population was fast approaching 7 million, and there was a heavy 